You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Father Paul continues his discussion of Genesis chapter 2 with the importance of rain, breath, and the Garden of Aden, located toward the east in the Syrian desert, a critical point in his book, The Rise of Scripture. Father Paul explains that it is God who planted this garden, not the human being. It is God who makes rain to produce the vegetation absent in verse 5, and ultimately, it is God alone who is the source of life. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. Last time we talked about how Genesis 2, 1 through 4 is connected with the end of chapter one. Again, it's very important for my hearers to understand. They have to dismiss chapters and verses. You know, all this appeared later and it breaks the flow of literature. I said enough how really Genesis is divided into Toledots. One through four is the Toledot of the heavens and the earth. Five you have Adam and then Noah. I mean, these are the sections that literature itself presents you with. It's not forced from outside. I remember Professor Veselin Kesic, New Testament at St. Vladimir's Seminary, who told me once, really, the church has to review the readings in the sense that very often they begin where they are not supposed to begin and they end when they are not supposed to end. So, This is something we have to get used to in order to perceive the original. Now, 2, 1 through 4, we have the seventh day, but you have already the preparation in verse 5 for the fact that the vegetation was not yet there for the human being and the animals to eat from it because God had not sent his rain, the importance of the rain here right from the beginning. Mitchell Dahoud, who wrote the most valuable commentary in three volumes on the Psalms, and everyone should read it, you know, shows that the verb tob, the good, what is good, very often in the Psalms, refers to the rain, and that is very important in the Syrian desert, okay? You don't have canals and seas and rivers. It's the rain that is very important. So here we see it reflected in the text itself. And on the other hand, there was no Adam, a human being, to serve the Adama. Again, I stressed so often this translation of serve for Abad instead of till or work. I mean, it's the same action, but the action is the action of someone that nurtures his mother, that nurtures him. Why is Adama the mother? Because in a few verses, the Adam is going to be formed out of the Adama. Again, of the essence, of the essence. And verse 6 stresses the fact of the water, the rain, that is given priority. So whatever man can do with the Adama is not enough unless there is rain. Okay, so there was no mist to water all the face of the Adama. Just count the times Adama appears in these verses in conjunction, obviously, with Adam, but also on its own. It is our mother. That's what we have at the beginning. And in verse 7, we hear that God 
forms. The verb yassar is very important. Yassar is the verb that is used to speak about the potter. He creates, he makes pottery from the clay, the mud, and it becomes something. So actually, the element is the clay. It is the form that gives the meaning. Take China. What's the difference between a saucer and a cup and so on? What is made of is the same. We call it China. But a saucer is not a cup, and a cup is not a saucer. So keep this in mind, that the human being is form shaped exactly the way later the animals are shaped, but not the way Eve is made because she will be built. I am trying to present as much as possible the link, the fluidity between each passage and the other. In a few verses, I shall show that the mention of the human being, actually it is in this verse 7, that the man, the human being, was made from dust from the Adama. Afar is dust. Why suddenly the dust is here? We shall hear it in 319 when God, as a punishment, will tell the human being that he's going to revert to return to dust because he is from dust. Very powerful, powerful. I mean, if people would just, how shall I put it? My suggestion is that the people will find a taping of these four chapters, perhaps push it until 11, or tape it in their own voice and keep listening to that every morning when they are driving. It's not very long. Even in English, it works <laughs> until they get to know it by heart. And trust me, they may still need me, but they will need me less and less and less and less. And then this will prepare me to die happily <laughs> that I have done something, not by explaining to the people only, but more importantly, by inviting them to absorb the text for themselves. So he formed the Lord God, formed the human being, dust from the Adama, and he breathed into him nishmat hayim. Neshama is a breeze a soft, very soft movement of the air that gives life. Again, later we shall realize when this is forceful and becomes a wind, ruah, it is destructive. The first appearance of the ruah is that not that gives life, but it is connected with the destruction, with death. This is where theology erred from the beginning. It is only under the control of God in Ezekiel 37 when instead of scattering further the dry bones, he lowered the speed of the fan, if you like, as I say in my classes, to bring together these bones. So very important. That's why God is the one that gives life and gives death in the Quran is very nice. Al-Muhi al-Mumit. Okay, there is not even and between the two. Okay, he is the one who grants life and he is the one who hits us with death as we shall hear in a few verses here. So Let's keep this complexity once more. It is not complicated. It is complex, but the solution lies in hearing the original words and understand their meaning and, more importantly, their function in the text. And when God does this, then the human being becomes a nefesh haya. We talked about that enough earlier, that he becomes actually the word animal in Latin 
and so on to speak about the animals in Greek, reflects the same understanding that it's something that has life that is expressed in breathing. Notice how in the police TV shows, to check whether someone is dead or not, one checks the breath and the pulse. Okay, so the human being is definitely not different than the animals, and this will be underscored in its way a few verses later when we are told that God formed in the same way the animals, in the same way in which he formed the human being. And then in verse 8, we have the appearance of that specific place of earth, of Adama or Eretz, which is Aden. Aden, the meaning of the word is delight. That's why in Greek we have it introduced as paradison at the end. Okay, paradise, a good place to be in. But what is equally important is the location, mitkedem towards the east or looking from the east. I discussed this in detail in my Land and Covenant and the commentary of Genesis, not so much in the rise of Scripture, so people would check with that. There is a play on the east, but it is the east that is more the Syrian desert rather than the place between the two rivers. It's a play on both. The rivers will be mentioned soon. But the mighty rivers are subordained to this little flux of water, flow of water that is in this Aiden, which is, you know, unexpected and very impressive that the four mighty rivers come from this small brook that is in Aiden. Again, we shall hear that Cain is sent also to the east to wander, and then the culmination will come in chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, where we shall hear that the people are also in the east. So this Cadem is very important, but Let's wait until we meet it again. So there is a pointer to the fact that is to the east, on the one hand of the area, which will be the scene of the story of biblical Israel, which is in Palestine along the seashore of the Mediterranean. But please keep in mind that Mikredim, means looking from the east. And thus, since the author were between in the land of the two rivers, looking from that area to Aden, that would be the Syrian desert. And it is there that he put the man whom he had formed. Notice the repetition in the original, that the man was formed And he came from the dust of the Adama, but God put him in a specific Adama. But this specific Adama, soon we shall hear that it is precisely the Syrian Arab desert. And I shall show you why it is so, because we have the mention of four rivers that are in Mesopotamia, and then in southern Arabia, and then in Egypt, even below that, in Sudan, Kush, Ethiopia, and so on. So it's a larger area. It's the world, if you like, the biblical world, the scriptural world of the scriptural story. And in 9, again, we go back to this earth, or the paradise, as being basically vegetation. Remember, at the end of chapter 1, vegetation and the trees are 
the basic, if not the only food of the human being and also of the animals. And we have here the same verb that we met earlier. He made to grow, yitzmah, okay? You have it earlier in chapter 1. So it is God that made grow out of the Adama. Go back to day 3 and you will see that we have first God issuing his order for the earth to produce, and then it produces on its own. Here we have the stress that, again, God is ultimately the source of life. Okay, remember, he planted the garden, not the human being. Verse 8, very important. It is God that planted the garden. And in 9, we have this repeated in the wording of he made grow. Every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. To understand that, one has to be, you know, not in an orchard, but in an oasis of the Syrian desert. And people have to make this effort, not assume that he's talking about every tree in our backyard of the orchard. Very important. And already he introduces these two special trees that will have a function in the story later. So I'll pass over them very quickly because we have to wait. Here again, people get excited about why is it so here are mentioned. You have to wait and get your answer the way you have to do when you're hearing John 1.1. 1, 1. You don't argue why the word is mentioned before God. Well, when you read, you realize that the scriptural God comes out of the word of scripture and not vice versa. The scriptural God is not encrypted. He doesn't come from outside and put in scripture. He comes out of scripture. Be it as it may, we have the mention of these two trees. And then we have this river. You will notice that it's the same word that is used to speak about this small river as the ones that are used to speak about the big rivers. To precisely underscore the fact that the water of the great rivers come out of the water of Eden. Let's hear it. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. Okay, out from the earth. It is as though it is a source. Later we shall meet the word Bika, which is a spot, a small source of water that is just a spot where the people have to go and find the water. This word becomes important in Ezekiel. So it comes out of the garden and from there it spreads Yifared, Yipared, which is the verb that is going to be used later about the nation spreading. Notice that is very important. People have to populate the earth, not gang together to build a city and its tower, which is basically Hellenic. That's not good. It's spreading. Again, that's the original, friends. That's all I can say. You know, you hear this it divided, you understand it as though, okay, from one you have four, you have to have a division, but that's not the idea. It's the preparation for the fact that this life in Eden should spread all over. Obviously, scripture has its bias, which is to underscore that ultimately life comes from God even from the specific spot in which he planted life at the beginning. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.